Well, hello, and thank you for tuning in to Biblio Video, the YouTube channel all about Canadian kids' books. My name is Spencer Miller, and today I am joined by Katharina Vermette, the Métis Winnipeg author um, who has written across all ages and all genres. Um, Katharina is known to write poetry, um, novels. She's written picture books. Today we're going to talk about her fantastic graphic novel series, um, Katharina is the winner of many awards, like the Governor General Awards. Um, she's also dabbled in film and done all types of interesting projects. Um, so we are very thankful to have you here today. Uh, a little intimidated to be talking with you, um, with all you've done, Katharina, but so thankful for your time. Thanks for being here. Marcy, it's my absolute pleasure, for sure. <laughs> Perfect. Well, today um, I really wanted to focus our conversation around A Girl Called Echo, um, the graphic novel series that has been coming out over the past few years, um, but specifically talking about it today because of the recent release of the Omnibus Edition, um, which for uh, viewers who aren't comic book nerds, an omnibus means they put all of the comics into one big book um, so you can read the whole series all at once. But for readers who aren't familiar with the series, Katharina, can you tell us a little bit in your own words what the story is all about? Um, for sure, for sure. And I always preface this by saying I'm the worst person to synopsize my work because what I think is about is about is not what marketing people think it's about. <laughs> um, but I I wrote this book. The the series is about a time traveling young girl named Echo. And Echo's superpower is like the original tagline of the book was Echo is a girl who with magical powers, she can read things and they come alive, you know, which is, of course, a magical power we all have. But the whole premise of the book is that she starts reading history books about her people, the Métis, Métis people, the Mitchiff people. Um, and then she is transported back into those times and gets to live out her life as a Métis person in starting in 18. 16 and going all the way up to like to present day so she really it's an exploration of the Métis popular history over the last 200 years through the eyes of this this young teenager no, I think you did a great job <laughs> surmising <laughs> and it's to give you some credit it's a very difficult series to surmise because I I almost call it an, an epic sometimes when I'm describing it because it it becomes very personal to Echo's story, but at the same time, you're covering hundreds of years of history. Um, so you, you took on a big, difficult task. Um, and so even just summarizing it, it's hard to do, but great job. Um, the first question I have for you, because you've written in so many different genres, uh, so many different styles for so many different ages, um, why is it that this story um, came to be written for teenagers and why a graphic novel, um, how did it go this direction? Um, well, th this book came about um, through something that happens very frequently in my life, which is I just put my foot in my mouth and end up talking myself into something I know nothing about, um, which is what I always do. So I was I was actually at Highwater Press, who is the publisher of the book. I was at that their offices for another meeting, and we were talking um, specifically about at that time they had only published one other um, female graphic artist graphic novelist who is Jennifer Stone Jennifer Storm sorry <laughs> um and there was a lot of dudes and other than and they also didn't have anything on Métis history so I was basically just you know talking about that saying you should have more you know non-binary and female um graphic novelists you know like let's spread it around you know and and then also you should have more Métis history here like there is so much Cree and there there just was a beautiful Anishinaabe series that that was just produced at the time so I was like we we need Métis here we're we're in this is Portage and Maine Press you know it, it's all about the Métis are here um and of course and Catherine Gerbasi who is the public or the the publisher you know just kind of pointed at me and said well you're Métis and you're female and maybe you can do something and of course I was like no no I can't possibly write a graphic novel I didn't want to write a graphic novel I had no idea how to write a graphic novel I love graphic novels but I had never written one um I always seem to just like you know that's how I find new genres where I just kind of go no I have no idea but 
but but I had a story idea and I had this echo idea of this time traveler and I really wanted to explore time travel because I love um, time travel just as as just a mechanism of connecting different parts of time and story and how they um how they are intertwined you know echoes modern day is so in, deeply connected to what happens in her past and i wanted to show how it was the history is ongoing and it still has not ended i wanted to really um dive into those history parts and and explore that i knew um i would say about 30 percent of what i what i ended up knowing, which is probably about half of what there all is to know if if that um maybe much, much smaller of amount of all the things there are to know around <laughs> these history um points in time because so much happened. So I really did want to dive in and learn more about that for myself. Um so it kind of all just fit. So I ended up um taking on the challenge knowing absolutely nothing and learning as i go very well, awkwardly <laughs> well for stumbling your way backwards into it I, I think you did a really great job and and like i said because the project is so ambitious and and i it's very interesting to hear that um like the history really drove some of your initial ideas around the project um it makes a lot of sense because the series is so deeply steeped in history um, I think like I also love time travel and and it's interesting in some time travel stories I think like the history almost becomes like a backdrop it's more you know maybe about just putting the characters in an interesting place but in A Girl Called Echo the history is not just like a backdrop like it is the story Echo as a time traveler um, isn't there to change history or affect history as much as to like observe it and learn from it and she really um, just gets to soak it all in like first person. And and so as a very, very historical project, my question is, you kind of alluded to it, but what kind of research went into that? How did you prepare to write a graphic novel series that, um, I mean, is almost like a history book. It's so complete in, in the story that it tells. Um. Well, thank you for calling it complete. It's so very incomplete. Wow. <laughs> There's so many things that um, I, it was so hard to decide what to put in because whenever you dive into to any kind of point in time, there's so many things and it was knowing when to stop. And sometimes I feel stopping too soon because I like all the mundane facts. You know, I like all the factors that went into like the Pemmican Wars, which is actually like, 50 years of history that actually culminated into what ended up being the Pemmican Wars. Um, and that's the same of, of everything. So it felt really limited to have to break everything down, not only by very small parts, but by scenes, right? Because stories are about scenes. So you can't, you know, we had timelines in the book, we had maps in the book, we had different biographies in the book, but ultimately Echo is again, it's her vantage point. So she's plopped into a story and we have to explain the story as it's happening and unfolding. Um, it felt really difficult to figure out what to say. I was incredibly daunted by the task of like talking about this history. I was obsessed with getting it right. I actually, um, one of the things we, we made into the project, wrote into the project is each book originally was published a year apart. Mm -hmm. actually between book two and book three there's a little more than a year just because of the way production ended up happening and I did that on purpose because I wanted to make sure to do my research for each era in its own so as much as I knew kind of the, the broad strokes of the whole history I wanted to make sure to go in and and dive into whatever materials were there um, the Pemmican Wars was really difficult because it was 1812 to 1816, 17. Um, and that was difficult because there weren't a lot of eyewitness accounts. It was a little different with the Red River resistance and the Northwest resistance because there was a lot of eyewitness accounts. There's so much academic work around those two movements. Um but yeah, the Pemmican Wars was actually a really interesting place to start because as we got closer and closer to modern day, there were more materials and more mm -hmm. people that you could interview or interviews you could read. Um, so each had its own life 
of research that it took on. Um, and in, in that way, it was completely unique for each book. But I did want to make sure it was as correct as possible. Um, there was a typo, actually. I In the first edition <laughs> of Get River Resistance, the book, book two, there was a date uh, typo. It was supposed to say June and it said July. And I was mortified <laughs> because, you know, history nerd, right? You know, yeah. the, the dates are the the basic thing <laughs> um but yeah that was really you know I felt a keen sense of responsibility for all of that for sure for sure that's so interesting um I called it complete you say it feels almost incomplete I imagine from your perspective because of all the research that you do I'm sure there's plenty that doesn't make it into the story um which kind of leads me to ask when you're writing how do you find that balance between keeping it historically accurate and including as much history as possible while also keeping the story you know very engaging so that teen readers are going to pick it up and enjoy the series well that part kind of felt easy because it's well again, I'm completely biased here, but it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are, you know, the first three books are about, you know, armed insurrections led by indigenous folks fighting for their rights against their imposing colonizers who want to, you know, take over their land. I mean, that's, it's all winning as far as engagement goes, you know, um, everything, you know, well, I shouldn't say that, you know, in the Luriel resistances, he um, really loved um, writing petitions. He was always writing petitions. So a lot of the action is actually like, I'm going to go write a petition. But, you know, a lot of other exciting things happen. But Luriel himself, ironically, not very, <laughs> not as exciting as all the other dudes who who had their rifles on and like the the pemmican wars i'm thinking in particular like there there was constantly skirmishes going on and guerrilla warfare at one another um i found it incredibly it, it felt like and that's why it feels incomplete because there was so much that i had to leave out you know and i um and there's so much about again we were trying to put echo right into the action while still keeping her safe um but what she sees and how she sees is just like almost chaos all the time you know so it felt like there was a lot of the action and trying to root it down to try to make sense of it ended up being the the difficulty yeah yeah there is a lot of action in this series um and you see it in in these fantastic like battle scenes also like um very emotional like speeches that are given um it is a highly engaging history and it's also captured so perfectly in the art um of course being a graphic novel series um you're doing uh you you know you're telling part of the story in the writing but of course we have to give so much credit to scott henderson and uh the colorist donovan yasiak um who do an amazing job with the series and i know they've done lots of other graphic novels for high water press and i always enjoy their art so much uh, i wanted to ask you um because Echo's such a, a lovable character, and, and I want to talk a little bit about more her, a little bit more about her in a minute. Um, but how does it feel when you imagine this character and write this character, and then get to see her and her world come to life in illustrations? Can you think back to the beginning of that process and what it felt like to see? I don't know if you were privy to early sketches or if that was a collaboration between you and Scott. What did that feel like for you? Um, it was a collaboration insofar as I knew nothing and he yeah. knows everything. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was more me sitting there going, okay, you know, in my very in the very writerly way, saying, you know, we I described her. She had bra she had French braids, she had blue hair, um, she had her ear earbuds in all the time. Um, it was an early agreement between Scott and I to make well, I wanted to to make her very 90s. Um hmm. And he really had lots of great ideas on her patches and her t-shirts. You know, I wanted her herself, you know, through her choice of clothing and through her musical selections that was speaking for her because the other irony of Echo is she's a pretty silent character, yeah. she's really quiet. She's really subdued, not in a re rebellious way, um, really in a or a disaffected way someone called her disaffected I'm like no I think she's incredibly engaged and in, but she's shy and she is disempowered 
And she's sad, you know, yeah. she's at school, she's separated from her mom. The incidents around why her mom and her are, are separated are never really revealed because there's so many incidences that separate parents from children. Um, but her mom is not well and Echo is living with an aunt. Uh, she's at a new school. She's She doesn't have community. And part of her first instances of going back in time is being literally with community and finding community in her past relatives, um, which gives her a lot of comfort. Um, so really it was show Scott and I um, were really trying to, sh well, I wasn't, I was describing it. Scott was actually doing work um, about how, um, and just putting all of that, all of that emotion into what she looked like and what she was doing, how the modern day shots are very close and contained, um, almost um, zoomed in shots are in some ways and very, very square. Whereas as soon as she goes back in time, the color palette expands and the zoom, like everything zooms out and you see natural scapes and bison running through the prairies and things like that like that was all my imagining um and then Scott just bringing it like Scott just making this amazing picture and then Donovan coming in and coloring it and it just felt like you know I imagine how they feel like you know when when TV's got Technicolor you ever watch those videos of, yeah. of when, at that <laughs> moment where Australia got Technicolor and it turns over like that's what it felt to me it felt like just this amazing experience of watching something I thought of come alive that's really beautiful um I, I love your answer because you started to allude to uh my next question um <laughs> which is about uh some of the the details that you can find in Echo's world so I I really love Echo as a character she um like it's really an incredible experience reading this story and I think it only can happen in a graphic novel form where a character that is you know so shy and so quiet is also so easily like you can connect to them and understand them and I imagine that would be almost impossible to do in prose to to write a character that almost hardly ever speaks um but in this graphic novel series because of the art you get to learn so much about Echo just through the details in the story um, and I mentioned to you just before we pressed record on this interview that I got to read this series with my students um, when during my first year of teaching and with a group of grade nine students, that was something that um, it stuck out to me even more because when we had like 30 kids in the room looking at the art, they were all noticing these little details and things that I had missed. And so they were pointing out um, everything from the patches on, on Echo's jacket and relating to seeing a rainbow patch or a Lego patch to um, the playlist and the CDs on her iPod, uh, the music, uh, looking at the book covers in the library. Um, so much of Echo's world comes alive in the details of the art. And so I've always wanted to ask you when I got the chance, were those details that you came up with or did that come from the illustrator? Because um, I think they're so important to the story. Um, I think I think you're right. I think they are important um, to the story. I I picked the mute. It it was both. I would say like a lot of those book covers in the library. Um, I had a couple ideas of what the books she would find in the library, and Scott came up with the rest and really rounded it out. Um, and that's kind of how we we worked. I would have like a small idea, and Scott would make it very big. Um, I I came up with the playlist. I obsessed over the playlist and. Um, and the 90s music was something we kind of stumbled on because I knew she had to be playing music because I knew she wanted to withdraw as much as possible and she wanted to be listening to um, to music. And But I didn't want to put, tr I didn't want to even attempt to put in what kind of cool music mm -hmm. the cool kids are playing nowadays. Mm -hmm. And even if I did at the time, if I put what my kids were listening to, it would be completely different and uncool now. So I didn't want to mess with that. Um, but also because she's experiencing a separation from her mom, I knew exactly what her mom would be listening to. Yeah. So she's so it just became this perfect kind of way to express, you know, how how much how sad she is and how much grief she is going through in in this transition. Um, and through the music, I um, it it starts off really like the first couple books are are quite sad songs. And then as um, she gets empowered, as she experiences this Métis history um, through, throughout the books, she gets just a little more 
yeah, empowered. She gets a little more radicalized, if you will. You know, she starts getting a little tough and she starts coming out of her shell. She starts discovering who she is and and meeting community through her friends and her teachers and in her modern day. So her music gets lighter. And in the last book, it even gets, dare I say, a little happier, you know, (laughs) which, you know, if you know 90s music from a certain era, there's not much happy music in there. Um, (laughs) So that was my that was my kind of contribution to that. And then the the patches just became this great way to communicate also how she's feeling, you know, like there's an anarchy patch, which yeah. I think plays perfectly with all the resistors and the Michif um the Michif resistance. Um, you know, just different things. You know, she's looking at her identity not only as a Michif person, but also looking at um lgbt 2s plus communities with through her friends so either an allyship or something that she's exploring on her own um uh, that's something that really comes through and again that's expressed you know micah was a real micah was a really important character because they go through transition throughout the story Mm -hmm. um it starts off as a very male presenting kid ends up being a very female presenting kid by the fourth book and that was something that scott um you know it was in the story but that was something that scott really expressed and said we're you know i think micah would be wearing something a little more feminine here because they're exploring and I you know I hadn't even thought of that because I know Micah had said something to echo you know because it's so in because when you're writing a book you kind of you're just writing it you know um and you're not necessarily putting in all the details so there's so many different things in the background that I would have never even thought to put in but of course Scott knowing what he is doing thank goodness you know was able to put all of those little things in and they just bring everything up right totally um no I, I really agree I, I think um with, with the music I think it was a great choice because I think uh from an uncool adult observer uh, some of <laughs> <laughs> echo style and music choices seem to be coming back in style if I understand correctly but certainly there's a timelessness to that 90s music um that connects there is there is I think yeah 90s music kind of uh yeah, it's it's gonna be here for a while. Like you know, when we were kids, it, well, when I was a kid, it was you know seventies music and sixties music. You know, there there is a timelessness in certain kinds of music. Yeah, and then I love that you you touched on um, just some of the subtle uh, representation um, to different LGBTQ characters. And I know, like in uh, the last book in the series, there's um, at one point. Mike and Echo are sitting under a like a pride flag and I think a poster for their school's GSA. And so some of those details, um, as subtle as they are, do really stick out. I, I can attest to that. I had students who stayed after class to come and uh, whisper to me, I, I noticed Echo's rainbow patches. And do you think? And yeah, I think maybe, you know, like it, it's there for a reason, you know. Um, and and so those are things that, that kids pick up on, recognize and feel seen by. So I'm so grateful that they were included. Um, um same yeah Yeah. I wanted to to ask you um with this new omnibus edition just being released um they've done a great job of adding I mean there's a new forward there's an essay at the end um there are of course the timelines and the maps and some of the details so it's really a beautiful way to uh, approach the series again um how does it feel to have this series that took up years of your life uh done with and to be able to hold it all in one new edition I think it's, it feels incredibly special to me. It's the, when I first read it, it was when I first, like we were talking about it in pieces for months and we were putting everything together. I did very little for actually putting together this Mm -hmm. omnibus because other people wrote things. Um, A designer and editor put everything. It was the easiest book I ever wrote Um, because I did, because everyone else did all the work. Um, (laughs) But when I put it together, I, I just, I remember just thinking, I didn't know I wanted this so bad. It was so, um, it's so special just to be able to flip through from one story to another, you know, and um, I I tried very hard to be continuous for each of the editions, but they were quite far apart, you Mm -hmm. know, so we we did a lot of the, that tweaking and fixing as we went, but to see them actually look like they're chapters rather than editions, um yeah it just feels 
and it's so thick you know these omnibus omnibuses are beautiful beautiful like com like any kind of comic book graphic novels right they always feel girthy and they yeah. feel like you know substantial and it feels like that you know it feels like real i don't know how else mm -hmm. to do it feels very special it's very special <laughs> Yeah, it really is. And um, with that, I also wanted to ask you, it, it might be hard to sum up, um, but what, <laughs> as a writer, what's kind of like the lesson that you take away from the series um, or from Echo as a character? Like, what's the thing that will stay with you that you'll take with you into future projects? What will I take with? Um, I really love the way art worked in this book. And I was incredible. And all the things that I learned, I don't know if I will write another graphic novel. No, I shouldn't say that. I know I will write another graphic novel <laughs> and um, I will go into it with so much better off than I was when I started poor Scott um, <laughs> when, I, when I knew nothing. Um, just the, the way the art can do so much of the heavy lifting and really makes my job as a writer really um really e well I shouldn't say easy well it is easy you know it is easy comparatively and just but you can do different things you know like you were alluding to echo being a prose book would have been completely different yeah. the time I would have had to spend describing these wars describing um you know the setup of the scenes that she walks in something that Scott was able to do just with the landscape you know um has the the time just being able to you know express echo as this silent you know she's not silence and she's a little introverted kid but she's not she's still so engaged you know she's not standoffish you know she's not anything else and it's just rendered so perfectly in in art so really it's certain kinds of stories just work in graphic novels so very well you know plus well, there's the whole factor right because the kids mm -hmm. love graphic novels so I am infinitely cooler post echo than I was before echo this is true and I, <laughs> and I'm glad to hear this is the lesson you're taking away because selfishly <laughs> I, I truly hope that uh echo is not the last graphic novel that we get from you I, I hope that we see more graphic novels from Katharina Vermette in the future I'll be looking forward to them well thank you um I really love it as a form so yeah I would absolutely love it I you know nothing planned but definitely the, it's the desire is there for yeah. sure that's so great um well the last thing for today Katharina is I have to give a big shout out to the folks at the Vancouver Writers Fest um they helped connect me to you and set up this interview um and so I wanted to give you the chance to uh let our viewers know um what uh, type of events are you going to be involved with at the fest? I know that you'll be um, there mainly promoting your new book, which is uh, great. You can also give us a pitch for that if you'd like to. I know our viewers would be interested, even though we focus on kids' books here. That's a series that they'll want to hear about as well. Um, mm -hmm. What are your plans for, for the Writers Fest? Uh, what are my plans for the Writers Fest? I'm doing two panels, I know, both evenings. I believe it's Tuesday, October 17th and Wednesday, October 18th. That, that's how dates work. Um, I love Vancouver Writers Festival. I will be talking primarily about my novel, which is my third novel um, called The Circle. And it's kind of mirrors a restorative justice circle where everyone is, different characters are talking about the effect that a crime has had on them. Um, but um I just, yeah, I I love the Vancouver Writers Festival and, and always highly, highly recommend it. It's all at Granville Island. If you're in Vancouver, Granville Island such a great place to, to be. Yes. Uh, all the events are there. Everyone's wandering around. This little island kind of comes alive and I have a great time whenever I'm out there. So yeah, please, yeah come out if not to see me see there's so many other writers out there I know they have a full extensive school program so. they really do yeah and we'll make sure to include a link to that in, in the description of the video so everyone can learn more about the event they really do have a fantastic lineup of programming for kids and youth I know that I get to attend this year it's going to be my first time um I've been to Vancouver before I love Granville Island so um, when I heard about the event, I was so excited and hopefully I'll bump into you there. Um, but uh, if not, I, I really wish you the best with those events and 
um, with the circle and everything that you're doing to to promote the book. Well, thank you. Yeah, I hope you have a great time at the the festival. I'm sure we'll bump into each. It's a small island. It's it's <laughs> all and it's full during festivals. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thanks again, Katharina, for your time. It was so lovely talking to you. It was very nice talking to you as well, Marcy. Marcy. <laughs>